So next speaker is uh, Tony Harding, and Tony is going to. Tony's been doing a lot of work on the uh, on the timber framing and got very enthusiastic. He got involved with the study of old buildings mainly through the early Dunster project, which he joined in 2018, mainly to do photographic recording at first. But uh, he got more involved and intrigued with the variety of styles of carpentry techniques which he's been photographing. Um, as the project is coming towards the end, he's trying to draw some conclusions about how these carpentry techniques may have evolved and changed over time. So, Tony, all over to you. Okay, as Mary said, thanks to everyone for coming. It's great to see so many people here. And um, I want to say particularly a, a thank you to the, the people of Dunster for allowing me to crawl around in your lofts for the last five years. And, uh, I thought it's probably time to give an account of what I've been doing up there and some of the stuff that we've found. Um, and, and to look at some of the subtle ways that, that carpentry styles seem to have changed through the centuries. Um, when I do these talks, it's usually, I find it's useful to start just with a, a quick look at the sort of um, the way that roofs are put together and, and some of the terminology and jargon that goes around them. So apologies to anybody that knows all this stuff, but it's, it's a good starting point. So the basic building block of a sort of, uh, particularly these medieval roofs, is a set of trusses or cracks, and we'll come on to uh, you know, which is which. Um, and they've got a, a number of sort of components or terminology that goes around them. Up at the top here, you've got the apex where they're made in two halves and they're joined together at, at the apex. I, I should say, I've, I've made up some models of different types of trusses at the back there. I've seen people having a look at them. They're, I made them up to be played with, so do feel free to take them apart and, and put them back together and have a, have a play. Um, so we've got the apex up at the top. <coughs> then there's a a sloping bit, which has got a number of names. It can be a, called a principal rafter, or just principal, or a blade, if we're talking about crux. Um, I tend to use the term principal, so you'll find me jumping around between blades and principles, probably. And you've got a, a horizontal member that's sort of keeping the, the two halves from, from spreading apart, called a collar. Sometimes you've got a, a second one of those, a bit lower down. Um, if it's sort of down at wall level, I, I tend to call it a tie beam. So those are the main terms that go around those. So to, to build a house, basically you took, oh, and then you've got the, the vertical bit, the poster foot that's usually buried in the walls. Um, so to build a house, you take a, a set of um, trusses or crux, anything between three and seven, probably, depending on, on the size of the house. And then there's some other bits of, bits of wood, if you like, that, that go around them. And, uh, Apologies to anybody that built, has built these things, because I'm probably making light of, of some of the, some of the terminology and the, the, the way they get put together. But um, running through the top, you've got a, a long timber called a ridge purlin or a ridge plate. It tends to be if it's laid on its flat, it's called a plate, and if it's sort of diagonal, it's, it's called a purlin. Don't know why. Um, and then down the side, you've got some more longitudinal, some purlins, side purlins, maybe two or three sets of those between the, the apex and, and the top of the walls. Um, then you've got some um, bits which I think are there for two purposes. Um, wind braces, which sort of stabilise the building, stop it sort of wrecking lengthways, and arch braces which do the same um, sort of laterally. Um, I think they, they serve that structural purpose, but I think there's there's an aesthetic with them and, and probably, dare I say, a little bit of vanity thrown in there as well. So, you know, my house is big enough to have wind braces, you know, sort of thing. So, um, then we've got uh, some common rafters as opposed to these principal rafters that are part of the trusses. We've got some common rafters and over that a roof covering, typically thatch in the early days. And it's interesting, it, it, it wasn't until I did this little set of drawings really, if you Think about that little rectangle there. That's how some of this wonderful architecture that we see in roofs comes about. And it is really is, you know, you sit amongst that and you think it's really a, a work of art. So, um, I'm going to talk about this in, in three main periods. Um, the early period, which 
so it runs from 1270 up to about 1400. Um, and it's not, not sort of black and white, but 1270 is about the earliest date we've got for surviving um, roofs in Dunster. And the way things were put together then, um, there were two, two types of trusses really. You had true crux, which Mary mentioned, and the thing that sort of characterises a true crux is each half, each half of the truss is made from one piece of one continuous piece of timber, and that that sort of dictates a, a fairly large or specifically shaped piece of timber to do that. Um, there's an example of, of one of those. I, I, I've drawn these little diagrams in nice straight lines. It wasn't always like that. So trees tended not to, uh, particularly oak trees, don't, don't grow in nice straight lines. <coughs> um, but there's a, a typical sort of true crop. Ignore this, this bit up here is um, later stuff, but the, the true crop is the blade is that bit you see running up there. Um, and then sometimes um, true crocks had arch bracing added to them. Um, you can see example here where um, you see the lower part, this down here is all part of the blade and then you've got this arch bracing set above it and um, the, the blade is sort of cut out their shape to accommodate the arch brace so it all fits neatly into a, a nice continuous curve. And you can see all these joints are held together with wooden pegs, you can see the, the, the pegs there that are sort of, um, you know, holding the whole thing together. Again, this, um, I haven't got the pegs, but on the, the little models I've made up at the back, there's, there's examples of these, so do, do feel free to go and take them apart and play with them. So, what did you, so true crux needed a specific, uh, specifically shaped or big piece of timber. Uh, you didn't always have that available, so, uh, an answer to that was a jointed crop where you, you make pretty much the same shape but from two, two pieces of timber joined together at the elbow. Um, there are several different ways of, of making that joint. All the ones we find in Dun Dunster are this sort of long tenon form. Um, there, there's a, a sort of long tenon that, that goes up into the underside of the, the principle. The principle is cut out to keep that, that curve. Um, and then wooden pegs through to, to hold it all together. There's some examples of those. You can see um, the, the peg holes where the, the joint has been held, held together. Here's one which um, has lost, the, the, the principle's gone. You, it, it's, it's, it's quite nice sometimes when things pull, fall apart because you can actually see what goes on inside. Um, there you can see that, that long tenon that goes in there with the, the peg holes and, and one peg still remaining. Um, now there's some interesting ways of, and there's a whole, you'd be amazed at the number of different ways you can join a truss at the top, and there's been lots of work done um, researching and cataloguing these ways, far more than I've got time to go through today, but I'm around this afternoon with the exhibition, if anyone wants to talk a little bit more about that. I'm just going to focus on some of the, the main types that we find in Dunster. And the two types are in this early period, sort of early 1300s, so late 1200s through the early 1300s, the two types that we find quite frequently. The first one is, um, one way of joining it is you have this um, saddle sitting above the top of the, the principles there. Um, and there are some, um, there's an example. Um, they're held together as an interesting shaped little tenon that goes up into the, the principle there. This one, like, like a lot of these uh, early trusses, is sort of, uh, you know, suffered the ravages of time a bit. And you can see here, the, see here this, the, the, the left-hand side is sort of collapsed inwards. But one of, the, one of the joys of digital photography is that you can do a bit of digital carpentry. And um, I've just taken a sort of mirror image of it there. And that's sort of how it would have looked, possibly in its early form. Um, the other type is um, similar sort of concept, but instead of a, a saddle above the apex, you've got this sort of trapezoidal yoke below. Um, there's an example of one of those. Um, and again, um, doing a bit of digital carpentry, we can see what it might have looked like in its, in its original form. The interesting 
point with this, and it didn't really sort of dawn on me until I tried to, to make a model of one, is that to get it all to come together, the principles extend upwards and, and sort of clasp the ridge timber. And it sort of dictates that the, timber, the, the, the principles have got to be tapered rather than parallel. And I didn't actually sort of realise that until I sort of tried to make one, really. Um, what's interesting about Dunster is, uh, Mary mentioned different types of trusses in the same roof. And we've got a couple of examples where we've got both of these types of apex in adjacent trusses in the same roof. Um, and you can see it's, um, so we've got one with the, the yoke type, uh, and then we've got the one with the saddle. And it um, must have been quite a geometric challenge for the, the carpenters to, to, to get all that to come together and have the, the same pitch and, and the ridge at the same height. Um, so we, and it's, it's unusual to, to find different types in there. We think it's probably just um, carpenters having to resort to whatever means they could to make the most of the available timber, really. Um, there's further evidence of that, um, and this is, this is one of the, the ones in question. And this, this right-hand side blade here, um, if you look closely at it, it's actually two pieces of wood spliced together. And it's, it's very well done. It's a, you know, an excellent bit of carpentry. This was, this was done, you know, early 1300s. Um, and in these same roofs with the, the mixed apexes, we've got several examples of that, that type of joint. So it, it suggests, you know, carpenters were really scrabbling around for, for whatever timber they could find at that stage. Um, collar joints, we, I've been looking at, at collar joints and there, there's a, a bit less variation in those. In fact, the same sort of method um, prevailed throughout, really from 1300 through to probably 1600. And it's, um, again, it's a, a mortise and tenon joint and uh, this uh, interesting shape tenon here. How do I know it's that shape? Well, there's, there's one that has sort of come apart and revealed itself to us. And um, at this point, what well, I would say at this point, people of Dunster, other dwellers of old houses, don't worry, your roof's not back to collapse, okay? <laughs> All of this stuff is, has either been heavily reinforced or it's sort of oversailed with a, a completely new roof. But here's an example. Somebody's had the, you know, the, the grace and respect to leave that original one in place, which I think is quite important. You know, that, you're looking at something that's 700 years old there. Um, you know, when that was a growing tree, Genghis Khan was probably still alive. It's, I, tend to, I tend to use, and I think it's because I seem to study him for what seemed like ages at school. I tend to use Genghis Khan. As, he's one of my waypoints in historical timelines. You know, <laughs> I seem to use bad guys to, to, to calibrate timelines, you know, Julius Caesar and other people. Never the good guys, but yeah, it, it just, I think, you know, Genghis Khan was still around while that was a tree. Yeah, wow. <laughs> um, so I can't now to the, the <coughs> mid to late medieval period. Things changed around 1400. I don't know if it was coincidence or as a consequence. Things went quiet. Um, in the second half of the, the 14th century because there was a thing called the Black Death going on. <laughs> and you would see very, very few houses built sort of between sort of 1350 and about 1400. <coughs> um, but again, there's a poignant thought actually that struck me when we got back to surveying after, after the COVID lockdowns, you think, blimey, you know, some of these houses have seen much more than one pandemic in their time, you know. <laughs> um, so how did things change? Well, 1400s was a, a things, and there was that, you know, what do they call it with COVID, a bounce recovery. It seems to be the same thing going on in Dunster. Dunster was a, basically a building site in the, in the 1400s, particularly the late 1400s. And some of the, you know, some of the, the, the finest buildings in Dunster came from that period. We've got the, the site block of the Priory, um, 4 to 8 Church Street, the nunnery, the old manor at Lower Marsh, <coughs> that wonderful roof in the Luttrell Arms, that dates from sort of late 1400s. We've got the Castle Gatehouse, and we, we did, one of the things that we found out, we did originally think that those big heavy wooden gates at the, the Castle Gatehouse, we thought they were um, 13th century, but we, with some of the dating work that Historic England has done for us, we, we now think that's, that's more likely to have been sort of in the 1400s. 
Uh, and there, that and uh, a lot of other work was going on at the gatehouse. And as Mary said, these, these cross passage houses, and then, uh, you know, a lot of the uh, fine examples of those date from the 1400s. So a lot of building going on in Dunster, and, and I think probably a lot of techniques sort of, you know, changed by, changed, uh, transferred, sort of passed around by word of mouth during that period. Um, a new, new type of truss, or at least it's sort of um, new to what we find in Dunster, sort of came on the scene there. Um, there's quite a lot of these, particularly in, in sort of late 1400s houses. Um, and I've called it an arch brace truss. It's probably got other people may call it different things, but I've done it to distinguish it from, from some of the others. It's basically a hybrid of, um, we talked in the 1300s about this true crop having um, arch bracing integrated with it. And we've already taken a look at jointed crucks. So what happens if you sort of cross pollinate a true crook with arch bracing and a jointed crook? You end up with something like this. You can see it's got the got that upper arch bracing bit that follows the, the true crook example of about 100 years before, and it's also got the same sort of um, long tenon joint uh, between the, the post and the principal there, um, albeit it's. it's and the, the whole thing sort of falls into a nice smooth curve there. So that seemed to be quite a popular technique in the, particularly in the late 1400s. There's an example, there's a fine roof, a fine, fine set of, those are these arch brace crosses, uh, trusses, um, fine set of those. Um, different things were going on at the, the apex of the, the truss as well. And um, we saw, uh, a form emerged, which uh, there's one example of back in the 1300s, but the, the example that sort of um, really took hold in, uh, in the 1400s and prevailed right through to the 1600s and beyond was this um, sort of perpendicular form with a, with a sort of mortise and tendon joint up in there. And that became almost a sort of default. Um, you can see an example of one there. Um, there's a There's a, a sort of a notch there. It's, it's, some of them are sort of like a straight joint there. Some of them notched in. I guess it just gives it a little bit more support stability. But they, they became the sort of almost universal. A um, few exceptions. Um, this one is in the site of Rock on the Priory, and it's it, it's unusual in that this form was more associated. You tend to find this more in to the east of Somerset and into Wiltshire. And it's got, um, a the, the, the blades meet sort of vertically there. And you can see if you look closely, closely it took me quite a while to spot this. The, um, that ridge timber is actually threaded through the bulk of the truss at the top. Um, as I say, it, it was, they were more common um, in, East Som in East Somerset and into Wiltshire. And I do wonder, we think the Priory was probably an outpost of Bath Abbey, and I just wonder if that's how that sort of joint sort of found its way to Dunster. Um, I've also been trying to find the same sort of chronology with purlin joints, where these, these side purlins um, are jointed into the, the, the main trusses. Less of a clear chronology there, uh, I have to say. There's just, just one example, and I'm still working on it. I, May get there, but um, one example I did just think we use interesting to point out. Again, it's in the roof of the, the priory, the south block, um, and one of the problems with with perlin joints, as with all joints, you, you don't really get to see what's going on in them unless they've fallen apart. And perlins get removed for all sorts of reasons, alterations, or they've they, they've sagged and failed. It, it's, it's quite hard life being a purlin, basically, in a roof. <laughs> They've got a lot of load on them. Um, and occasionally it opens up a, a, a vacant mortise. And you can see this one has got this little sort of triangular cutout. It's, uh, it's got a name. It's called a tenon with diminished haunch. It's got this bevel on the upper shoulder of the, of the mortise. And it's been recorded um, elsewhere. Uh, uh, gentleman called Cecil Hewitt, who was one, 
one of the great, probably the great recorder of medieval carpentry. He found this same joint in the roof of King's College Chapel at Cambridge. And his thinking was, and that, that dates from, I think, early 1500s. Um, I think it was designed in the 1470s. But his thinking was it was the, he thought it was the first use of this, this particular joint um, in that context. But the, the wing of the priory that this, in, that this is in is at the same time, or if anything, slightly before King's College Chapel. So again, we, we may have a first in Dunstan, <laughs> but at least it, it, it begs the question, you know, was there a connection? Did that jointing method find its way from Dunster to, to Cambridge uh, by word of mouth or whatever? You know, there wasn't the internet, there wasn't a manual of medieval carpentry, so a lot of these things are guess spread from word of mouth, you know, in the in the tavern, you know, after a hard day's work building houses. Um, so that's Tenement and Diminish Haunts, possibly a first for Dunster. Um, so we'll just take a quick look at how did things change. And things started to change, as Mary said, after sort of 1600. Um, and trusses started to change. You tended not to get the vertical posts. Um, you had the, 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 the truss sort of sitting on top of the wall, um, sitting on these long planks that, that ran along the top of the wall called wall plates. Um, the collar joint was different too. Um, it was, uh, we'll take a look at those in a minute. Um, but still this same sort of tenon form of apex that seems to have sort of hung around from, from 1400 onwards. So just looking at a few bits, so there, there's an example of one. Um, and it's not too dissimilar to, to what's up here, actually. Um, for, yeah, presenters, biggest mistake is telling people to look around them, you know. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, the collar joint is, um, and there's some good examples up here if you look later. <laughs> um, it's sort of, rather than mortise, rather than tenon into the principle, it's, it's <coughs> lapped on, usually with this sort of, some sort of lapped or uh, notched or dovetail shape, which helps to stop it pulling out. In many ways, it's, it's probably stronger than the, the tenon form, because the tenon form is, you know, it's only got those couple of pegs holding together. This one, you, you'd have a devil of a job to pull that out. It's interesting because this sort of form has also been recorded, not in Dunstan, there's nothing early enough, but in, in parts of Devon and other parts of Somerset. This sort of thing has been found in yet earlier buildings, <coughs> in the 1200s. And it seems to have disappeared then and come back into use in the 1600s. I think one possible um, explanation for that is timber started to get thinner. I, I think there was probably a, a learning process. That, you know, the, and as a general rule, timbers got smaller as time went on. And some of the early ones are absolutely massive timbers. And I think probably there was a gradual learning of, you know, <laughs> hey guys, we're doing a bit of over engineering here. <laughs> so, skinny stuff now. <laughs> So um, that, that may have been one reason why, why this sort of lap form came back into use. You can see a couple of other examples there at the side um, from other places in Dunster. Different variants on this sort of notched form. There's one that hasn't got the notch, it's just, it's just sort of straight, but uh, same sort of concept. Um, up at the apex, you can see that same sort of uh, tenon form in it. One of the things that occurred to me is if, you know, if, the, if the collar is lapped on, why isn't the, the apex of that joint? Um, but believe me, it took me about an hour and a half of sort of forensic study and photographs to convince myself that this one is, is, is actually, there is actually a, a tenon up in there. Uh, and finally, um, down at the bottom end, I said, you know, instead of a, a post set in the wall, um, the bottom of the truss sort of sits on a wall plate, and there you can see it good example that survives this. This bit here would have been, get the pointer to it, this would have been part of the original wall of the building. You can see that wall plate sitting on top and the, the base of the truss sitting on there. So that's probably all we've got time for in this sort of wall. <coughs> um, but I'm around with the exhibition this afternoon if you've got any more questions or, and please do pull apart those little model trusses and, and put them back together again. So, Thank you.
I'm sorry we don't have much time for questions today, but as Tony said, all the speakers will be available over lunchtime, and I'm sure they'll be delighted to uh, have some questions.